Well, whenever I meet someone new, I tell them that I'm originally from the state of Wisconsin. It's almost a guarantee that their next comment will be something like, so you're a Green Bay fan. <laughs> and sometimes it's said with noticeable excitement, so you're a Green Bay fan. And other times I notice a hint of disdain and disappointment. So you're a Green Bay fan? And whenever I notice disapproval, I usually follow up by saying, well, after I moved to Texas, the Cowboys became my second favorite team. And sometimes that helps me. But other times, it hurts me even worse. Case in point, I was recently talking to an Eagles fan and a Vikings fan. And I quickly changed the subject, but with the Vikings fan, I have to admit, I said first, you're a Vikings fan? <laughs> with clear shock and disappointment in my voice. Of course, uh, a lot of people these days are Kansas City Chiefs fans, including here in the great state of Texas, as Patrick Mahomes played both Texas high school football and at Texas Tech. The Chiefs are also winning, which definitely helps. This season, they are trying to become the first back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back NFL champions since my Packers did it, uh, back in 1965, 1966, and 1967. And it would be a very impressive feat if the Chiefs three-peat. But our text today contains something infinitely more impressive than three championships in a row. Last week, in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15, our Lord Jesus Christ miraculously fed well over 5,000 people using only five loaves of bread and two small fish. But then, after taking a small break to pray on a mountain alone, in John 6, 16 through 21, and its sister passages in Matthew and Mark, Jesus performs four more miracles back to back to back to back to prove beyond the shadow of doubt that he is God in the flesh. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 16 through 21 today. John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21 this is God's holy, authoritative, inspired, and inerrant word. Please stand with me as we read it together. John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. This is what it says. <clears throat> now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea and got into the boat and went over the sea towards Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat. And they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. Well, last week our text ended with John 6.15 telling us that after Jesus miraculously fed over 5,000 people, <clears throat> these same people started thinking about forcing Jesus to become their king right then and there. Now you would think, ordinarily, this is a good thing. After all, Christ means king, so Jesus being recognized as a king, isn't that a good thing? Well, not in this case. Not in this case. Let me tell you why. What these people really want is not for Jesus to be king over their heart. That's what needs to happen. That's what all of us need to do. We need Jesus to be king over our heart. 
These people don't want Jesus to be king over their heart, though. What do they want? They want him to be a king who will always give them free food, who will always give them free and 100% effective health care and automatic deliverance from whatever else that ails them, including the oppressive Romans. Now, swap out the Romans with, say, Russia or China or Iran, and let's be honest, many people in this country today are also looking for the government to do those exact same things. But the government is not God. Far from it. Only Jesus is God. And another common problem both then and now, besides people treating the government as God or just wanting the government to take care of them, they just want Jesus to take care of them, is a lot of people are very selfish. Many say, and are now saying here in this text, that they want Jesus to be king, but only so far as to meet their every desire. What most want, again, is they don't want Jesus to be king over their heart, that they would seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's what we're supposed to do. They don't want that. And Jesus knows this. And Lord willing, we will begin to see how he addresses that starting next week. But in the meantime, Jesus breaks up this misguided coup. The feeding of the 5,000 plus took place in a deserted area east of Bethsaida, according to Mark 6.32 and Luke 9.10. And like many towns and cities today, Bethsaida had a river running through it, in this case, the Jordan River, as it entered the Sea of Galilee. And like Kansas City, most of Bethsaida was east of the river, but there was a small part on the west side. And so in the evening, right after this miraculous feeding, Mark 6.45 and John 6.15-17 through 17 shows Jesus telling his disciples to get into a boat. It was their boat. It was the only boat that was there. They're supposed to get into that boat, and they are supposed to go west. They're supposed to go west to the other side of Bethsaida towards Capernaum, which is about five or six miles in distance. Jesus then also sends the crowds away before he goes up on a mountain alone to pray. So that's what's going on as we get into this text. But the disciples are traveling, and under good conditions, it shouldn't have taken them too long to row from where they were to Capernaum, five or six miles away. After all, several of the disciples were experienced fishermen. But disaster strikes. Disaster strikes. A storm arises in John 6, 18, and the winds are against them. And as I mentioned last week, the Sea of Galilee is in the Great Rift Valley, which gives it the distinction of actually being the lowest freshwater lake in the world at about 700 feet below sea level. It's a unique lake. Yet around the lake are mountains some of which rise to about 2,000 feet above sea level. And so there's a 2,700 foot difference between the lake and some of these mountains around it. And that 2,700 foot difference in elevation does offer some tremendous views of the lake if you ever get a chance to visit Israel. But they also make the lake very, very vulnerable to sudden storms. Warm, moist air from the lake rises to meet cooler, drier air on the mountaintops, and it's an instant recipe for storms. Even today, the nation of Israel has rules about modern power boats. You know, engine out the back, you know, uh, can go really fast, not run by oars or sails or anything like that. Even today, modern power boats in Israel are to be docked when one of these storms arrives. These storms on the Sea of Galilee are no joke, even today. So if I ever get to go, I may avoid the boat tour. Uh, but 
John 6, 19 says the disciples are fighting one of these sudden storms here in the middle of the night. And they had only progressed three or four miles. They still got a couple miles to go to reach their destination. And now it's three o'clock in the morning. So they left in the evening. Now it's three o'clock in the morning. So they've been on the boat for probably six to nine hours, somewhere in there. A long time. And they've only gone three or four miles. Not very far at all. Because the wind is against them, according to Matthew 14, 25 and Mark 6, 48. The disciples have literally been fighting this storm all night long. If I were them, I would have said, we should have waded across the river and walked. You know, it's like, we would have been there hours ago and we wouldn't have been all stressed out fighting the, way, the storm on the boat. But you'll notice, Jesus was the one who told them to get in the boat. It wasn't their decision. He told them to take the boat back. He wanted them to get in the boat. He wanted them to get in the storm for a reason. I hope that comforts you. Because, you know, sometimes we go through storms in life. Sometimes we go through things in life that are not fun. We're like, man, I wish I didn't go through this or wouldn't be going through this right now. But, you know, sometimes God has a purpose for that storm. He, he wants you to go through the storm because he's going to make you a better man. He's going to make you a better woman having gone through the storm. Remember that. Because he has that with the disciples here. Jesus had the disciples get on the lake and face this storm for a reason. What's the reason? Well, like the crowds... Mark 6.52 says that the 12 disciples also failed to understand how the miracle with the loaves pointed to Jesus as being God in the flesh. They missed it. And you might be thinking, how in the world could they have missed it? It's like, if I would have been there, I would have been like, yeah, Jesus, I can tell you're God in the flesh. Nobody else could do this. You did it. But the crowds didn't get it, and the 12 disciples didn't get it. How come they didn't get it? Well, probably for the same reasons I don't get things sometimes. My heart's hard. Sometimes our hearts get hard. And, you know, it probably didn't help that the disciples were still sad about the death of John the Baptist. You know, that's hanging over them. Also didn't help that they were tired. Also probably didn't help that they were hungry. That's a bad combination. Sad, tired, and hungry. I mean, I can be grumpy, you know, if all those three things are happening to me at the same time. Um, and so their hearts are hard because of other circumstances that they're going on. And you know, remember, they're, they're tired coming back from that mission trip. And so they're, 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 just, they're just not in a good place. And they, they just miss it. Along with the crowd, they just miss the significance of what Jesus just did. But Jesus is about to do something back to back to back to back to kind of get his disciples out of this funk and realize, oh my goodness, I am in the presence of the Son of God himself. And we need a wake-up call like that too sometimes, don't we? I know I do. Mark 6, 48 says that Jesus saw his disciples straining at the oars, and so he came to them. But, it's funny in Mark, it, it says that it also looks like he decided to mess with them a little bit. You know, you ever have friends just kind of mess with you a little bit? Looks like Jesus had a sense of humor. God has a sense of humor, too. It looked like he was going to pass them by. You know, it's like he's walking out of the water, and you're like, Jesus, you're going too far. Yeah, yeah. Come here. You know, it's like it's almost like he's messing with them. Now, he fully intends to go to them and, and, and help them, but he's messing with them a little bit. It's like, do you think I'm coming? Do you think I'm coming? Yeah, you know. God has a sense of humor. <clears throat> Looked like he was going to pass him by, but it didn't. he wasn't going to. They're three or four miles out, but they're also thousands of feet from the nearest land. Thousands of feet from the shore, according to Matthew 14, 24. 
And yet the disciples see Jesus out there walking on the sea. Now some people marvel at the common basilisk, also known as the Jesus lizard. How many of y'all have seen videos of, the, of this thing? This lizard that can run across the water. It's pretty cool. Uh, it does this, uh, for is able to do this for two different reasons. One, forward momentum, that really helps. Uh, and the broad surface area of its feet. It, it, its, its feet are so broad and wide and put its toes together that it can trap pockets of air between its foot and the water to kind of keep itself going along with the forward momentum. And so it can travel up to 66 feet across the water before it finally starts to sink. Pretty amazing creature. But Jesus is more amazing than the Jesus lizard. Much more amazing. Let me tell you why. Jesus isn't running. He's walking. The water isn't calm. Jesus' lizards kind of need calm water. No, Jesus is walking, not running, and it's a storm. It's stormy. The, wet, the water's not calm at all. It's all over the place. Sloshing. And, again, the Jesus lizard can only go about 60, 66 feet, and then it starts to sink. Jesus is thousands of feet out. Walking, walking, not running, on stormy water. It turns out the Jesus lizard has nothing on Jesus Christ himself. There is absolutely no natural explanation for what Jesus is able to do here. And that's the point. That's the point. Jesus must be a supernatural being. Has to be. The disciples just get mixed up as to what kind of supernatural being he is. Because while John 6.19 says the disciples were frightened, Matthew 14.26 and Mark 6.49 gives us even more detail as to why they're frightened. In Matthew and Mark, it says that they think Jesus is a ghost. They think he's a phantasm. Now, I thought about not getting into the ghost part of this, but... I saw some stores putting out stuff for Halloween right after Independence Day. And I don't know about you, but seeing a giant Grim Reaper display when it's 105 outside just doesn't compute. Uh, just like, that just doesn't seem right to me, you know. It's 105, and <laughs> it's not fall yet. Uh, uh, but, but anyway, uh, let's get into it. Uh, uh, Ghost stories obviously go all the way back to the ancient world. This is not a modern phenomenon. Uh, obviously, the disciples heard ghost stories since ghost is the first thing they think of when they see Jesus walking out on the water. But how does God's Word want us to look at the topic of ghosts? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 says that Christians are of Christians, that we are absent from the body, and to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The parable of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke chapter 16 also shows both the righteous and the wicked going to either heaven or hell immediately upon death. And therefore, we can see, just looking at those two passages of Scripture, that under normal circumstances, a person's soul or spirit does not linger upon the earth after death. We can see that clearly. 1 Samuel chapter 28 does give one exception to this. Uh, when the spirit of the prophet Samuel, who's already died, is brought back to announce judgment on King Saul. But again, this is an exception, not the rule. And the spirit of Samuel only appears briefly for this purpose, and then he leaves and goes back to heaven. So what can we conclude about ghosts based on these scriptures? Well, we can conclude that the vast majority of ghost stories can be explained by natural phenomenon and or wild imaginations. However, the Bible does speak of other supernatural beings who are out to deceive. Beings known as demons, evil angels. 
And biblically, it is possible that real demons could be behind some ghost stories as well as some UFO sightings. Thankfully, it seems such cases are quite rare. But in those rare cases, if, if you ever read about some of these, um, it's interesting, what, uh, the youth, we actually watched a video about this uh, last year, but uh, in those rare cases, it's interesting, sometimes people, as they're going through this, they call in the name of Jesus, and suddenly that entity, be it a ghost or an alien or whatever it is, just freaks out and leaves. Why would a ghost, why would an alien be freaked out by the name of Jesus? unless they're not really a ghost and not really an alien. They're a demon and they don't like the name of Jesus. Kind of makes sense. But unlike the demons, Jesus isn't out to deceive. He's come to save. And that's exactly what he has come to do here. In John chapter 6, verse 20, Jesus tells his disciples, It is I! Do not be afraid! So Jesus... Walking on the water, that's the first miracle. But then, Matthew 14, 28 through 31 tells us of a second one immediately following. In fact, it goes on at the same time. Let me read it real quick. Matthew 14, 28 through 31. It says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So Jesus was not only able to walk on the water, he also gave Peter the ability to walk on the water. However, Peter is only able to do so briefly. He's able to do it for a little bit, which is a second miracle. But then he starts to sink as fear and a lack of faith quickly cause him to sink. And by the way, it's not an accident that being afraid and having little faith are both tied together in that passage in Matthew. All of us deal with fear, myself included. All of us go through times when we're afraid. But in those moments, it is very, very, very important to remind yourself of your faith and trust in Jesus in those fearful moments. Extremely important. Now, I'm not perfect, but when I start to feel afraid in my best moments, which is not all the time, but in my best moments, when I start to feel afraid, I tell Jesus I trust him. I just tell him. I'll do it out loud even. Jesus, I trust you. I tell Jesus I trust you. I tell him I know that you're always in control. Even right now in this situation, I'm afraid. I tell him that out loud even. Now, I also tell Jesus that even if the worst happens, which usually when I'm just kind of gripped by, I don't know if this happens to you, this happens to me. I'm a bit vulnerable here. It might sound weird. But a lot of times when I'm afraid, like, I, I have this irrational fear that somebody I care about or love is going to die. That they're about to die. That's usually what hits me. And so what I do is I tell Jesus, Jesus, I know that you are there, I know that you're always in control. And I know that even if the worst happens, this person I care about dying, I know that you have power over death. And I'll see him again. And every time I find myself praying this way, during those fearful moments, the Lord gives me peace. Make Psalm 56.3 your motto. When I'm afraid, I will trust in you really helps. Really helps. So the first miracle, Jesus walks on the water. Second miracle, right after that, Peter briefly walks on the water. Then there's a three P. There's a three P. 
Again, this is in Matthew. Matthew 14, 32 says, And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Jesus calms the storm that the disciples have been fighting all night. And this is the second time he does this. I, I, I have to admit, I'm a little embarrassed by this. I was telling Julie about this. I'm a pastor. I should have known this. For some reason, I didn't, though. I didn't realize Jesus calmed the storm twice. I feel like an idiot. And I was like, how did I not know that? I should have known that. You know, it's like, I've studied this before. How did I miss it? You know, I was just, I don't know. I wonder at myself sometimes. Uh, but Jesus calms the storm twice. He did it once before. Uh, the first was between John chapters 5 and, and 6. Mm -hmm. Because in Matthew 8, 23 through 27, it talks about how Jesus is asleep in a boat. This is an earlier time. Storm arises. The disciples are like, hey, wake up. We're about to die. How could you be asleep? And so he wakes up. He's like, rebukes the winds and the waves, and immediately they become calm. The disciples are like, what kind of a man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. But that's a different occasion. That's an earlier occasion. But this has happened once before. And again, notice the disciples' reaction. The disciples' reaction is, what kind of a man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. It's like, this is weird. Not really sure what's going on here. Uh, but he did it. You know, but they're, they're just, you can tell they're still confused. They're like grappling with it. It's like, what kind of a man is this? It's like they're not sure. Yeah. But after Jesus walks on the water, after he has Peter walk on the water, after he calms the storm a second time, the disciples have a much different response this time. But first, a fourth miracle. A fourth miracle. Go back to John chapter 6, verse 21. We've been in Matthew. John chapter 6, verse 21 says that after Jesus was received into the boat, immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. They weren't there yet. Uh, Jesus originally sent the disciples west in the direction of Bethsaida and Capernaum where Peter's home was. That was again about five or six miles across the lake from where they started. But Matthew 14, 34 through 36, and Mark 6, 53 through 56 both say that Jesus basically teleports them immediately from where they are to the beach at Gennesaret, which is about nine miles from where they started. So he takes them even further west than where they were originally going. And the reason why is because Jesus wants to heal some people there early the next morning. He's like, we're going to go a little bit farther and I'm going to heal some people over here. And then we'll go back to home to Capernaum. A couple crazy things about this. One, Jesus is always thinking about how he can help and serve more people. He's like, he's like thinking, okay, I want to go over here. We're going to heal some people first and then go home. Um, if Jesus is always thinking about how he can help and serve others, should we, his followers, be doing the same thing? I think maybe we should be thinking constantly about how we can help and serve others. But notice, John doesn't really go overboard. Like, if I was writing about this, I'd be like, Holy Spirit, we got to get into this. And, you know, we got to elaborate, you know, you know, because this is a big thing. Uh, they teleported, like, miles in an instant. You know, it's like, we got to blow this up and make this sound grand. John, though, doesn't go overboard. In explaining this or the other miracles, he just says, yeah, it happened. It happened. By the way, that's another reason why we know we can trust the Gospels, because a lot of times when you're reading, like, fairy tale stuff, like, they really, like, ham it up. You know, like, oh, like, what this wizard was able to do. You know, you know. and the Gospels is like, yeah, it happened. Moving on. It, it's almost like the miracles are a side issue, and they are, because the main point is, God has come to us in the flesh. And we need to trust in him. Uh, it, it's, it's very different from a fairy tale. But again, if the disciples were three or four miles out in the lake, according to John 6, 19, 
and Gennesaret was nine miles away, then that means they traveled the remaining five or six miles in an instant. You know, my snapper's not working. Uh, but they did it in an instant. Jesus had the disciples travel further in a split second than they had managed rowing all night long. It's amazing. And all four of these miracles, Jesus walking on the water, Jesus giving Peter the ability to walk on the water, Jesus calming the storm again, and now instantly teleporting five or six miles to Gennesaret, all of this stuff is done back to back to back to back. It's a four-peat of feats, unachievable, completely unachievable by any other person. Why did Jesus do it? Why did he do these things? What, what do these four consecutive miracles accomplish? Let me go back to Matthew again. Matthew 14, 33. It says, then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. <coughs> you notice the difference here? The disciples went from, what kind of a man is this? You know, the, the, the first time he calmed the storm, to saying after he calmed the second one, and a couple other things on top of that, truly, you are the Son of God. Keep in mind, the disciples had previously seen Jesus instantly heal probably thousands of people prior to this point. They had already seen him calm a storm once before. They had even seen him bring two dead people back to life, not to mention the feeding of the 5,000 plus that we looked at last week. But this is what it took. Four back to back to back to back miracles in quick succession to finally, finally get the disciples to realize beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the Son of God not just because John the Baptist told them that. But I knew that from the start of John. John the Baptist said he's the Son of God. So, hey Jesus we think you're the Son of God. They said it but they didn't really believe it. It was like John said it. So we'll just say what John says. We'll just kind of go with it. But they didn't really believe it, but now they do. This is what it took. It's undeniable, given everything they have now seen. Because Job chapter 9 verse 8 teaches only God can walk on the waves of the sea. And they just saw Jesus do it. What's your conclusion? What's your conclusion? I ask this because when the Holy Spirit had John, the son of Zebedee, write this gospel, he did so to convince you and me. Maybe you've heard before that Jesus is the Christ. Maybe you've heard before that Jesus is Lord. Maybe you've heard before that Jesus is God in the flesh. And maybe you just went with it. Like all these other people are saying, it. I guess I'll just go with it too. It's kind of what the disciples did. John said it, so we'll just go with it. Maybe he just took other people's word for it. But at the same time, maybe you didn't really think about it too hard yourself. Like you just kind of went with it, but you're, you know, inside, you're just not totally sure. Yet, through the Holy Spirit, you can now see John is clearly making a case. He's presenting evidence. He's addressing skepticism. He is demolishing every argument so that logically there can only be one conclusion. Jesus really is the Christ. Jesus really is Lord. Jesus really is the Son of God. That's what J.C. came to realize. That's why she got baptized here this morning. What about you? Let's pray.